Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. I hope everyone's doing well. Today we have an interesting paper, a classic paper to discuss. It's about NOE fractures. This paper comes from Dr. Mark Woods and Dr. Manson, who are plastic surgeons from John Hopkins. Um, this, public, this was published in 1989. It was initially presented in a conference and then subsequently published. Um, it talks about both their classification system along with their treatment algorithm. And it's a classic paper because I'm pretty sure a lot of you are probably quite familiar with their names and their classification system. It was very well received and it's commonly used and, you know, it's what we it's what we all refer to NOE fractures. We pretty much everyone's using their classification system along with a lot of the trips, the tricks and tips that they talk about in their treatment. All right, so let's dive into the paper. So NOE fractures. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I just keep saying NOE. NOE is nasoorbital ethmoid, um, and that was a classification system. That was a that was a term that actually predates Markowitz and Manson. Although they they interestingly preferred the term nasoethmoid orbital. If you see here, even in the title and throughout the paper, they referred. So technically, they 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 called it NEO, but I'm going to just call it NOE because I think that's the term that that everyone uses and probably you're more familiar with. Anyway, so when it comes to NOE fractures, we have three types according to this classification system. And the classification system is based on the comminution of the, the fragments of um, the comminution of the fracture along with the 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 um, me, medial canthal tendon and whether it's still attached or whether it's severed. Um, and it directly correlates with treatment. Uh, they talk about how prior to them, people were trying to do this without surgery with like external splinting and they got not very great results and there was a need for surgery. They they were doing the surgery prior to 1989, like in the 70s with just, you know, wiring. And then they mentioned that in 1985 and then subsequently they were able to adopt uh, plates and screws and more modern techniques. All right. So let's start with the definition. What is an NOE fracture? Uh, in the simplest form, I like very much like how they put it over here. An NOE fracture involves the lower two thirds of the medial orbital rim. And let me just show a picture of you so you can see it right there. This piece of bone, when you see a fracture right there on the medial orbital rim that extends up to the NF suture and involves the medial orbit and the piriform, that's an NOE fracture. And of course, this would be like a type one because it's not common and it's just a single, single fracture, single segment fracture. So that is an NOE fracture. It involves multiple bones. It's the junction of the lateral nose, the inferior orbital rim, the medial orbital wall, which comprises the ethmoid bone and the lacrimal bone, the nasomaxillary buttress along the piriform and the frontal process of the maxilla. And again, you can, you can picture it right here. It involves all those bones that we just mentioned. That's an NOE fracture. Okay. Um, in terms of diagnosis, physical exam, bimanual examination. So, um, you know, I try to stick to the paper, but, but sometimes I like to mention like uh, tangentially important things relevant to NOE fractures. So I'm just going to mention what a, uh, a very common um, part of the bimanual exam. You may hear this term. It's a bowstring test. So I just Googled it and this is a picture that comes up and this just shows it very nicely. What this test is, is when you put your finger here on the medial orbit uh, or rim and you're feeling the bone and then you pull on the skin and if, if the medial canthal tendon is still intact and the attachment is still intact, you're going to feel resistance. And if you don't feel resistance or if you feel some bone moving underneath your finger, well then you know you have disruption and you have... Um, you know, a type two or, or, or quite possibly a type three NOE fracture. So a bowstring test is, is one of those physical maneuvers. And, you know, most likely you're also gonna diagnose this with a CT scan. Um, and I mentioned already they were doing this with wiring and then in 85, they started doing plate and screw fixation, fine. All right, classification systems. So there's unilateral and bilateral. There's isolated and extended. Extended meaning it involves, it's like a pan facial. So it involves NOE plus other fractures as well. And within 
if we're just talking about NOE, he has three types, type 1, type 2, and type 3. So type 1 is a single segment, so no comminution. Type 2 and type 3 is where the comminution starts, but the difference is in type 2, you have comminution, but the medial canthal tendon is still attached to some central fragment of bone, and that's not involved. And whereas type 3, there's comminution that directly involves where the canthal tendon inserts, and essentially the canthal tendon is severed. Okay, now that knowing that classification system, that directly relates to how we're going to treat it. Um, so we're going to jump. That's the next thing he's going to talk about. So here's a picture of a type one. You can see this is a single segment. And even within single segment, he further talks about how they're not always complete, they're not always displaced at all the juncture sites. So in this picture, you could appreciate that here, inferiorly along the rim, along the piriform, it's displaced. But superiorly, by the NF suture, it's non-displaced. And by the nose, it's non-displaced. So he talks about how you would treat this differently than if it was displaced and he calls that a complete if it's displayed on, displaced superiorly and inferiorly. All right, um, in terms of treatment, he talks about interfragment wiring that was done for some patients, and then later they started doing plate and screw, okay? Um, here's a picture. This he calls this complete, so you can see this is displaced both inferiorly and superiorly. This would be a bilateral, but interesting, this is a bilateral single segment. So both the left and the right are one single segment. Now we're jump. Now the next one would be here's a nice illustration of a type two injury. Here you can appreciate there's comminution, but it still, you, despite the fact that there's comminution, the fractures do not extend into the area of the canthal tendon. Okay, so the canthal tendon is still attached to a central fragment. And then let's get to this last picture. <laughs> this is nice. Here you see this comminution where the central where the canthal tendon is attached is disrupted and you have canthal avulsion okay so that that would be type 3 in terms of frequency I did see a, a chart because it's pretty rare I think that's worth mentioning so type 1 was about 50 percent of the cases that he had type 2 was 44 and type 3 super rare only six percent of his cases okay so that's pretty much it for classification system. Now let's jump, you know, so it logically follows the treatment algorithm. So let's start with exposure. So there's basically just two things you have to know for exposure. If you need to access the superior, he, that's how he breaks it up, the superior nasoethmoid region, well, that, that's preferentially exposed via coronal incision. Yes, you can use lacerations. Yes, you can use local incisions, although those are not preferable. The, the most cosmetic incision and the best access will be the coronal incision. So superior coronal, at least that's what he prefers. Um, inferiorly, you're actually going to do two incisions. So the inferior portion of the NOE fracture is exposed with a lower eyelid subsiliary incision. So if you want to get this medial rim right over here in this picture, you're going to go with a he did subcellulary, but of course it could be any lower eyelid incision. It could be transcon transconjunctival. It could be, you know, infraorbital, anything in that region. And then for the piriform, he would go in transorally with a maxillary gingival buccal sulcus incision. And here you can already tell he's a plastic surgeon because we don't call that a sulcular incision. We call that vestibular, but we know what he means. Okay. So that's it. That that's what that's for exposure. Now, how much fixation is is necessary? So he talks about it here. He says, what if it's a in this non-displaced, incomplete fracture? So basically, in that first picture I showed you before, you have no displacement superiorly, only have displacement inferiorly. So simple enough. You manage it by an inferior approach alone. Probably what you assume. And then when it comes to a complete unilateral single segment injury. He talks about how you should play to both inferiorly and superiorly. And he talks about how if you're concerned about um, the medial orbital rim being lateralized, which would cause telecanthus, which probably should back up and just pause for a second, just talk about telecanthus. One of the concerns when it comes to NOE fractures is, and the reason why we keep talking in the medial canthal tendon, I kind of, I guess, uh, 
made a few assumptions there. Maybe we should just talk about that for a second. So when <laughs> the most important thing when we talk about NOE factors is the medial canthal tendon. Why? Because when the medial canthal tendon is disrupted, what you have is you get telecanthus, which is widening of the can intercanthal distance. So normal intercanthal distance is somewhere in the low 30s, so say 32, give or take. Um, interpupillary distance is somewhere in the low 60s. So say 62 or 64, it's roughly half the intercanthal distance. So that's another good way of knowing it. Um, and of course, there's racial uh, variance, but anything more than 35, that's generally considered abnormal. So you get you start getting into the range of telecanthus or widening of the intercanthal space once you have more than 35 millimeters. All right. So now let's continue where we were in the little little break now let's jump right back so he talks about in complete unilateral single segment injuries if you're concerned about widening or if the medial orbital rim is going to be lateralized let me show you a picture so let's say let's say you were worried about this this bone being lateralized and your fixation was inadequate well then the only thing you could do because you can't put you can't put uh, hardware like a plate and a screw on the medial orbit you could do a wire and that's called transnasal wiring where you run a wire from one side of this nasal bone now it's technically not a nasal bone this is the ethmoid bone and the lacrimal bone that you're running the wire through but you'd run it back and forth and then tie it down okay um, so that's transnasal wiring and that is the best way to prevent uh, lateral displacement and that's when it comes to single segment unilateral fractures. Now we, then he talk, jumps to the next thing. We're talking about bilateral single segment fractures. So the picture over here was, where was that picture? Mm, skip it. Right here. This is a picture of a bilateral single segment. He says, actually, when it comes to this, interestingly enough, because as opposed to unilateral, when it comes to bilateral, you don't have to worry about te telecanthus assuming it's a single unit right you can't both sides can't lateralize because they're pulling on each other so a single it's assuming it's a single segment you don't have to worry about transnasal wiring all right so that's pretty much it for type one now he talks about comminuted fractures so essentially type two and type three once you get to comminuted fractures you need better exposure you're talking about both superior and inferior exposure and both superior and inferior fixation and then the question is what about the canthal tendon so if the canthal tendon is not detached you should not detach it in the process of trying to reduce it he talks about this how some other surgeons recommend it and it's obviously very delicate and it's very hard to aesthetically canthopexy to put back in the right place so if it's not interfering with the reduction you just leave it as is and you work around it you try to um, you try to fixate whatever the comminuted bones you can and whatever bones you can if they're too small you take them out and you bone graft um, and that's what he does quite a bit um, and then he talks about when it does come to can canthal reattachment you're going to use a separate transnasal wire and you're going to run that to the anterior lacrimal crest um, and I'm going to have a picture of that in a second and he makes a really important point and this point is frequently asked on the boards um, he does mention this another important point when the canthus is just detached you could pass like a lacrimal probe to identify the lacrimal system to avoid placing a suture through the through through the lacrimal duct as you're trying to do this canthoplasty or canthopexy as it's sometimes called reattachment of the canthal tendon um all right and then he also mentions dacrocystorhinostomy which i should just mention that's anytime you get epiphora which is just um you know profuse tearing or uncontrollable tearing which is called epiphora that's due to a lacrimal obstruction so you have to create a new outlet for the, the lacrimal sac and basically just do this procedure. It's called DCR, dacrocystorhinostomy, where you punch a hole through the lacrimal crest, the lacrimal fossa into the nose. And you just create a new fistula path and you can put some kind of tubes 
uh, temporarily until that track fistulizes. All right, um, kind of tangentially just wanted to mention that, continuing on, talked about very infrequently, would you have to do any frontal sinus treatment when, in conjunction with this? Um, then in his discussion, he mentions how prior to open reduction, people like in the 60s, they were trying to do this with closed reduction. And even when it, sometimes it was performed, it was delayed because of, you know, other medical issues. These patients usually had very significant head trauma. But even when it was done acutely, often it had very poor results, right? They, by doing a close with some kind of external splint, obviously inadequate to recreate the delicacy of an NOE fracture to fixate all of those little bones along with the medial cantal tendon. All right, now he's got some pictures. All right, and then I wanted to mention this. When you do transnasal wiring, you have an option. So here's, a, here's a, a diagram. You're putting the transnasal wiring from one side to the other side of the ethmoid bone. If you go anteriorly or anterior to the medial cantal tendon attachment, that doesn't quite really, that's not effective. Why? And this, this picture shows it because where the cantal tendon attaches to the bone, it can still splay. You still get that lateral splay because your wire is all the way anterior. Whereas if you put past your wire posterior to the cantal tendon attachment, well, then you won't get splay. So that's the question that's always asked. Where do you pass your wire in relation to the medial cantal tendon? It's always posterior and it's always superior. And that's to prevent intelecanthus or widening of the intercanthal distance. All right. That's an important point. I wanted to mention that. He talks about often he would need bone grafting depending on the amount of comminution and if you had to take out little 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 segments of bone. Um, when it comes to re, re, reconstruction of the orbit, we understand that it's not the globe position that's the most important, it's the volume or the, the size of the oral cavity, the orbital cavity. You want to recreate that as symmetrically as possible. And that's basically it for this paper. It's got a lot of really good points. It's got a very classic system that I think everyone's familiar with, and I just I wanted to show you his pictures, talk about some of his diagrams, talk about his language and what he stresses. A lot of his tips and tricks clearly did a really good job with the surgery to this day that everyone still references the Markowitz and Manson classification. Anyway, that's it. Uh, I hope you guys found that useful. Really would love to hear from you. Any feedback in terms of what you guys think about NOE fractures? Are you familiar with Markowitz and Manson? Did they do a good job? Uh, do we do we learn things from plastic surgeons? There's still a little stigma there. Um, anyway, hope you guys have a great day, and I hope to see you again soon.